Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Season 5 Hardcore Build Guides to get you through Hardcore League as quick and fast as possible so you can guarantee you're going to have a good time and also get all those sweet rewards. You've got all sorts of cool things. Eye effects, footprint effects, uh, special cloaks, all sorts of cool stuff that you might want to get. And so I have some characters designed to help you do that. To get us started, we're looking at Barbarian as one of the first options. Now, Barbarian is great. It's free to play, uh, and it's super tanky and defensive. If you like playing melee, you like using a two-hander, and you want to get pretty much all the rewards done without a lot of challenge, Barbarian is for you. Now, this character starts with a 18 strength and constitution. Very important. And then just a little bit of intelligence just to get a couple more skill points because they can come in handy. As far as how you actually spend those skill points, this character uses Jump, Swim, and Use Magic Device. These might not seem like the most optimal skills, but Barbarians don't need too many. However, Use Magic Device is fantastic, allowing you to cast the Shield spell. And it's important to note that you might think that it's not important as a Barbarian to have access to Magic Devices. Trust me, you need it. Um, one of the most dangerous effects in the entire game is Magic Missile, and if you do not have Shield on, it will kill you. So keeping that up all the time is important, so make sure you have some Use Magic Device. And outside of that, Swim and Jump, they get the job done, let your character move around and be more mobile, which is important for surviving in these quests. Now, during the level up process, all your feats are fairly straightforward. You're going to take the two-handed fighting feat line, power attack, and more two-handed fighting feat line, as well as some improved critical. This character is all about getting a big two-hander and just slashing your way through monsters. As well, I went the more tanky route, grab toughness, some more toughness, uh, just get a bunch of that extra hit points, and then even moving into the epics, taking one of the new barbarian feats, epic barbarian damage reduction, which allows you to have even more damage reduction and become even tankier should you decide to go into epics. Fairly straightforward, very, very basic feat selection here, just for damage and defense going all the way through. As far as the enhancement point layout, uh, this league went with the combination of Dwarf, Ravager, Occult Slayer, and Frenzied Berserker. Um, of course, there's quite a few points spent into Frenzied Berserker. This gives you a bunch of your damage, and it's one of the first things you want to do is rush Blood Tribute. This is extremely important. You want to rush this as fast and as soon as possible. This allows you to spend one of your points of constitution to gain 150 temporary hit points, and that's a lot of health. As long as you press this button, you basically can't die. So you rush Frenzy Berserker here, get that, and then spend the rest of your points in Ravager, work your way up Ravager, and then once you have these points spent, then you can spend some points in Occult Slayer over here, picking up some of that extra elemental defense, guarding Bond, you know, keep protecting yourself, and then moving back into Frenzy Berserker as a last effort. Uh, a lot of the stuff in Frenzy Berserker is stuff like uh, extra damage, so it's cool and it's helpful, but it's not going to keep you alive, which is why this other stuff is a little bit more important. And then finally, we have the Epic Destiny. Uh, for this character, I think it's best if you just spend your points in Fury of the Wild and Legendary Dreadnought. Fury of the Wild is really defensive, tanky, gives you a lot of hit points, and it gives you a ton of damage, giving access to Primal Scream for some more stats, just so you can uh, hit a little bit harder and have a bit more defense. Adrenaline, so you can literally one-shot any monster you come across. And, of course, uh, the extra healing effects from Embrace the Pain, as well as Unquenchable Rage, allowing you to just constantly pump out heals on yourself. And your big epic moment, Unbridled Fury, gives you unconsciousness range, and as well, the cores give you even more unconsciousness range, making it very difficult for your character to actually die in epics, because if you go unconscious, thanks to all these passive healing effects, you're just going to get back up. Now imagine for a moment that you do not wish to play as a barbarian, but instead you'd like to play as a rogue because you got obliterated by a trap as the barbarian and you want to have a way to deal with that. Well, I have for you a rogue build that will get you through all of the traps in the game very successfully. This is a thief acrobat rogue, which gives you the ability to use quarter staves and to great effectiveness. Thief Acrobats get a bunch of defensive abilities, high dodge chance, evasion, a lot of good things. The one downside is that they kind of require a lot of stats. You need intelligence for your skills and your disabling device and that sort of thing, and you need strength for all the two-handed fighting feats, and you need dexterity to actually prevent yourself from dying, and you need constitution. This one's going to be a little bit tight and definitely has a little bit more finesse, so if you're somebody who is you know, worried about not having the strongest character, I would... Uh, you know, maybe advise going more Barbarian or somewhere else, uh, but this character can get the job done. Starting here with enough Strength, Dex, 
constitution and intelligence, and then putting a little bit into strength later when you want to take some more of the two-handed fighting feats. As far as the skills go, you got to focus on the main rogue skills. Uh, you get a whole bunch of them. Use magic device, as we talked about for Barbarian, important for the shield spell, uh, as well as just self-healing yourself if you don't happen to have a cleric or a friend nearby. Tumble, swim, spot, uh, search, disable device, open lock, all the things you need to do as a rogue. Jump is nice because your character doesn't get jumped naturally and being able to climb gaps, get over top of monsters, get out of a sticky situation is really useful. Haggle, because gold is hard to come by at the beginning of every hardcore season and getting consumables is really strong. And then of course balance, because when you get knocked down, you got to get back up again. As far as the actual feats that you take, uh, this character goes in a bunch of different directions. You take the two-handed fighting feat line because dealing damage to enemies is really powerful. On top of that, you also grab Improved Feint. Uh, this is a melee attack that bluffs enemies, and it does not use your bluff skill. You'll notice I didn't put any points in bluff. That's because as a rogue, you get two attacks, Improved Feint and Shiv, and both of these automatically bluff the target, meaning you don't actually need to use them. Or you don't need to use the actual bluff skill. It just automatically uses, uh, like bluffs targets so you get the sneak attack damage. Very, very powerful and very, very strong. And this hits multiple targets, of course, because you have your Thief Actor Bat Quarterstaff and you have a bunch of Strike Through. And this character also takes the least dragon mark of shadow. Now, the reason why I did this, and especially I waited a little bit, is because this character is an elf, and this gives you the ability to use the uh, dragon mark of shadow to get displacement for yourself, which makes you extremely tanky and defensive. Now, elf might seem like a weird choice because, of course, you're playing on Hardcore League. Elves have a little bit less constitution, but it gives you more dexterity, which you need, and on top of that, it also gives you more search and spot, which is very helpful for checking out those traps whenever they end up coming up. Moving up into epics, fairly standard, just grabbing a lot of the two-handed fighting feats, some more defensive stuff, and then sign of the ethereal plane to get some access to lesser displacement and some bonuses skills and sneak attack dice, as your character scales very heavily off of sneak attack dice. Moving into the enhancement tree, you spend a lot of points in Thief Acrobat and a lot of points in the Elf tree. And the reasons kind of make sense. The Thief Acrobat tree gives you a whole bunch of offense and defense. One of the first things you want to get is stick fighting as soon as possible. Once you get this, you have dexterity to hit damage with your quarterstaff, but also the Swords to Plowshares feat, which gives you plus two critical threat range on your quarterstaff, so you actually have a 15% chance to crit instead of a 5%. That crit chance is really nice because it just means that when you encounter a monster, you can kill it quicker, which means it hits you less often, which is very, very good. Additionally, spending some points in the mechanic tree can be good. Grabbing some extra uh, disable device, open lock, and repair is not bad. And on top of that, you get more saving throws versus traps, which is always helpful. Additionally, if you have the requirement for more search and disable, you can also put some points into mechanic awareness. And I've also put some points into keen senses here, just to make sure you have the ability to search out traps, you have the ability to disable them as well. Out of the Assassin's Tree, you basically just want to get up to Assassin's Trick. It gives you the ability to take away sneak attack immunities on monsters for things like Constructs and stuff or Undead that always have it. And then, of course, out of the Elf Tree, you're picking up a bunch of Hit Chance, because Hit Chance is always nice, and the Dragon Mark of Shadow, which lets you displace yourself, which gives monsters a 50% chance to miss you at all times. And that's not even including your dodge and your other fantastic defensive abilities. Now, this character grabs pretty much all the good stuff out of Thief Acrobat, grabbing stuff like the Quick Strike for all the Double Strike, the Shadow Dodge for some extra dodge, Strike Through Tripping Chances, as well as the Acrobatics for the Attack Speed. This is essential. You just want, you want to take Thief Acrobatics right away. 15% Attack Speed is insane, and so you just grab this as soon as possible. And then, of course, Stick Fighting as soon as possible. And then moving up, grabbing all the defensive stuff like Vault, allowing you to charge around really quickly and easily, and Spinning Staff Wall for a whole bunch of defense whenever you need to, because 50 physical resistance rating is no joke. That is a huge amount of damage reduction. And then moving into the epic destinies, this character, I felt it would be good to go with a combination of Shadow Dancer, Fury of the Wild, and Unyielding Sentinel. Unyielding Sentinel is great, and you want to get this, you know, put points in here right away, uh, effectively getting yourself Renewal so you can heal yourself easily in Epics. Uh, Fury of the Wild is very nice because uh, getting extra bonuses to trip DCs while you wear light armor is good. Your character, as I said, doesn't actually use, like, the trip skill. You have the Sweeping Staff Strike, which knocks targets down, but this is an extra six DCs, and that's very, very strong. And it gives you the extra unconsciousness range with Die Harder and Die Harderist, which is just good for hardcore. 
the rest of your points go into the Shadow Dancer tree, picking up a whole bunch of damage, and this character uses the Shadow Dancer mantle to get some more movement speed while stealth. You don't really use stealth it often, but you can if you want. The most important thing is the Ink of Reality and Concealment here, which is really nice. The Helplessness Damage, which is really nice. And then moving up to the Capstone to pick up the, or the top tier here, to pick up the Shadow Mastery, uh, which basically makes it so that if monsters touch you, they die, which is really good, as I'm sure you can imagine. Now moving on, let's talk about Spellcasters. You don't want to play a melee, you don't care about traps, what you want to do is you want to blast some people with magic. Well, do I have the character for you? And that is free to play Cleric. Now, Cleric is both defensive because it's got lots of healing abilities and you can wear heavy armor and shields and offensive because you can strike people down with holy fire, which makes this character very, very strong. I went with the Dwarf here because even though it has a reduction in charisma, you basically just want more of the defensive stats. Now, in the actual stat breakdown with the points that you spend, it kind of comes out in the wash. No matter whether you take Dwarf or another race, it kind of comes out even. However, the Dwarven Tree gives you a whole bunch of extra defensive boosts, and we'll talk about that when we get there. So you kind of go with this even split here for some spellcasting. Starting with a 16 Wisdom, or a 16 main stat on your spellcaster isn't great, but especially if you're leveling a lot through Elite Difficulty, and playing Elite Difficulty mostly, you're going to be still overcoming pretty much all of the spell uh, saving throws of monsters you encounter. Now, since I have a 10 intelligence, you only get two skills, so heal and spellcraft. Spellcraft increases your spell damage, heal increases your healing power. So both are pretty obvious and fairly good. However, as far as the actual level ups go, your character is going to be picking the Sun Domain and the Follower of Orion. Uh, Orion doesn't matter what the favorite weapon is. What matters is that at level 6, you can pick Orion's Instruction, which is when you press a button, you gain plus 4 wisdom for a long time, which is effectively plus 2 to your spell DCs. Very, very strong and just generally useful to have. And Sun Domain gives you a huge amount of spell-like abilities, so the Searing Light spell-like ability, Sunbeam, and the Sun Burst. All of these you can apply your metamagic feats to, which is of course why you take Maximize, Quicken, and Empower. Cleric is like the king of metamagic feats. You're constantly blasting them out uh, of your spell-like abilities with the Searing Light spell-like ability, the Sunbeam spell-like ability, the Sun Burst spell-like ability, and on top of that you also get spell-like abilities from your actual Cleric Tree and from Epic Destinies. Which is, again, why we take Intensify and other spell-like abilities, or not spell-like abilities, um, metamagic feats here. Heightened spell, same reason, just bumping up the level of all of your different spells to increase the DCs on them, which is important. And we grab Evocation Focus here as well to make sure your spells always land. This is exclusively an Evocation Focus character, so you're blasting people out. And don't worry about having heals, you always have heals because you're a Cleric. So that's why we're going all in on the Evocation and then grabbing a little bit of toughness so you have a little bit more hit points as you level up. And then moving through into epics, the only exception to what I said is Burst of Glacial Wrath. This is a evocation-based crowd control effect, and so since you're all in on evocation, it just makes sense to have an ability where you can press something and freeze all the monsters in front of you. Very, very strong and very, very useful. As far as the actual enhancement tree goes, this character uses a combination of Divine Disciple, Radiant Servant, and the Dwarf Tree. We don't put any points into War Priest here, even though there are some defensive things. I think it's better to go kind of lean more into Radiant Servant, Divine Disciple, and Dwarf. So, in the actual trees, Divine Disciple is kind of like your bread and butter. You want to be putting points into here whenever you can, whenever you can afford it, because all of this stuff is really good. Grabbing like the improved Quicken and Maximize, so that when you actually do cast some of your spells, you're not actually worrying too much about the uh, extra cost of Quicken or Maximize on them, specifically like some of your healing spells possibly, or the higher level spells that don't get spell-like abilities, as well as grabbing all the light crit. Universal spell power here because you do use a good combination of fire and light spell power, so it's nice to have both. And on top of that, some spell-like abilities. As I said, the spell-like abilities, Nimbus of Light, very, very good for leveling in the early game. Once you get around level 7 or 8, you can take the points out of here and spend them wherever you want, so you don't need to have 54 points spent in the street. It's a little bit overkill. Uh, however, Holy Smite, amazing. Flame Strike, amazing. You're going to be casting these things all the time, and you're going to be really having a good time. However, early, I would recommend putting points in Radiant Servant here and grabbing the Cure Moderate Wounds spell-like ability. It has a 6 second cooldown, but it basically has no cost, and you can apply your Maximize, your Empower, and your Quick into it. So, effectively, once you have this ability, at level 3, um, since you're playing as a dwarf, you can press this button and it's going to heal you for about half of your hit points. And then once you get a little bit higher, it's going to heal you for even more. Highly recommend this ability. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. It's very, very, very strong. And then later on, whenever you feel like it, grab the positive energy burst. And then out of the dwarf tree, there's just health, 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 con, con, and then 5% bonus hit points. 
you don't want to die. So that's very, very nice and very helpful. As far as your spells go, the type of spells, I put the whole list here. Generally, the rule that you'd want to go through is pick offensive spells first or make sure you have offensive spells of each level. So, you know, make sure you have here Searing Light, make sure you have Holy Smite, make sure you have Flame Strike. Grab the offensive spells first and then go with the defensive ones later. Then healing spells or protective spells next versus utility. So for example, at level four, you want to grab Death Ward before Divine Power. Divine Power gives you more physical resistance rating, which is cool, but Death Ward prevents instant kills. And you're playing on hardcore, so please cast Death Ward on yourself. It's obviously very good on a place where you don't want to die, because you don't if you don't know the game that well, you might not know when an instant kill is coming. Additionally, heal. This is basically when you press it, it's going to give you full health. So yeah, that one's really, really good. Also try to take Word of Recall sooner rather than later. This is a button that teleports you to the Temple of the Sovereign Host in House Deneath, which doesn't sound that important, but basically what it means is if you're in a pinch and you're in a bind and you're going to die, you press Word of Recall and now you can't die. You're in town. You're no longer in the quest. You're not near the monsters. Everything's cool. So keep that in mind. Word of Recall can be your best friend. Now, uh, I mentioned there's two extra new spells, Celestial Bombardment and Divine Wrath. Um, the builder here doesn't have the correct details about the spells, but these two spells are bonkers, like mega bonker, bonkers, they're insane, and this is why I had the efficient metamagics. You're mostly not going to be casting most of your spells, you're probably not going to cast, like, Sunbeam, the spell, you have the spell-like ability. You're probably not going to cast Searing Light, the spell, you have the spell-like ability. However... You are definitely going to be casting Celestial Bombardment. This is one of the highest damage spells in the game. And Divine Wrath. These are both extremely powerful uh, offensive spells. And so reducing the cost of your mana magic feats from your enhancement tree is essential. However, we don't stop there. Going into the Epic Destinies on this character, I recommend Exalted Angel as kind of one of the main trees. Exalted Angel gives you two things. One, the angelic form here, which allows you to have this Holy Presence effect, which means you heal every six seconds. This healing is going to be, for the most part, your entire health bar every six seconds. I am not joking. It's that good. Um, and that's passive. And it affects all of your allies. Very, very strong. With this, it's almost impossible to die. However, you also grab the Sun Pillar here for a bunch of damage. You can just slam somebody, again, with your Maximize and Power, Intensify, Quick, and all that other stuff. And it stuns people later on with the Holy Command. You also get a Cure Moderate Mass that you can apply all your metamagic beats to. And you get cheaper Maximize. So now your Maximize actually only costs 7 extra mana instead of 25. And free Intensify. So you can Intensify and Maximize any of your spells for 225 spell power at the cost of 7 mana. And that's really good. Holy Fireball is nuts and will kill every single monster in the entire map in one hit. Uh, there is, if you play on Epic Elite, uh, there is literally not a single monster in the game that will survive a uh, all your metamagic Holy Fireball. Uh, unless it's a boss. Every regular monster is going to die to this, so make sure you press this all the time. It's very fun. Then I went Draconic for two reasons. One, spell cost reduction is really good. This is 5% and 5%. And second, uh, this gives you... Um, Coalescence, which gives you a little bit of damage reduction uh, bypass or spell spell damage reduction bypass. So if a monster is resistant to fire damage, this gives you a little bit extra on the top. And then Scales of the Dragon, which ha gives you a shield. Now people get confused by this ability. It says you absorb 15 damage or 15 points of damage per character level and 50% damage of the element of your dragon type, which in this case is red here for like an extra resistance to fire damage. However, uh, these are not connected effects. So the Ablative Protection does not just protect you from fire. It's all damage types, so just keep that in mind. It's basically a 450-point shield that you use every 30 seconds. Very, very, very useful to prevent you from dying. All right, now we're going to start the part of the video where we're done with free-to-play stuff, and now we're doing some of the pay-to-play stuff. And we're going to start with Artificer. Artificer is extremely versatile, getting all the trap stuff out of Rogue. However, Artificer can more easily focus on intelligence, getting a higher trapping skill, which means you don't have as many requirements for your items as a Rogue might, and you might be able to do a quest that might be a little bit above your level or like closer to your level than a Rogue might be able to do, especially on such a tight budget. However, this Artificer is going to be two things. Number one, you're going to be a Warforged, because healing yourself instantaneously is way better than waiting on a potion to move. And second, this is a Caster Artificer, because Caster Arty just clears rooms. One button press, you're going to be walking through rooms and clearing everything. Keep that in mind that this character is extremely, extremely good at checking and clearing rooms. A very strong contender for the 5k, especially if you're looking for all those rewards. This is going to be a very good one. Max your Intelligence. 
max your con, and if you have some points left over, dump them into strength. Uh, this character, you just want to be able to carry some stuff. If you happen to have a 32-point build, take some more con, obviously, here, uh, and go with that. Now, as far as the actual uh, skills go on here, artificers get less than rogues, but the same rules apply. Uh, open lock, search, spot, disable device. The classic rogue skills, you need all of these. Uh, haggle is nice for getting some prices lower, just so you can buy some more consumables. Artificers can make great use of wands, so like stone skin wands and other things. So uh, make sure you have a lot of money rolling around so you can then buy all of those extra cool consumables. Use magic device, of course, for those wands. And then repair and spellcraft, just bump up some of your spell damage effects. Now, as far as your feats go, you're going to be grabbing a lot of the meta magic feats as well as some of the more defensive tanky feats. So meta magic feats both bump up all your spell like abilities, of which you will have quite a few on this character. And on top of that, you've got the adamantine body to make you super tanky during the leveling process, and insight for reflexes to give you a much higher uh, saving throw against any type of trap or dangerous effect. Because this character, sometimes you might have to run through a trap, but having a a really tanky body and the ability to make reflex saves makes you really really strong in this capacity also grabbing invocation focus because it's the only thing that matters for artificer and then because you have spell like abilities heighten also fits in well here um moving on into the later feats you also pick up a lot more tankiness from construct exemplar for some more magic resistance rating and deific warding for some more defense and epic damage reduction so this character is very very tanky um even it's probably one of the tankiest characters that I've put in here so far in terms of just raw defense without any items. No items, this character is sitting at 90 physical resistance rating. That's absolutely massive. With items, this character is easily going to be hitting over 200 once you actually put some gear on it. If you do want to take it all the way, entering the heroic leveling process, you're just going to be super tanky and defensive. Uh, so it's very, very good, very versatile. Now, as far as the actual enhancement tree here, your character is going to be spending most of your points in Arcano Technician, some in the Renegade Mastermaker, and some in the Warforged Tree. Warforged Tree, save for absolute dead last, unless you have some racial points from like a racial point tome or something when you log in. Uh, dead last, this is the least important thing. What matters is getting both Arcano Technician, which is really, really powerful, getting points in here, especially stuff like Imbue Defender, getting some more uh, spell power and what have you, um, and getting a lot of the points in here, and Renegade Master Maker, of course. This is where you want to be spending your two points, points in here, and points into Renegade Master Maker. Kind of split them up a little bit even, but you want to make sure, at the very least, by level 12, you want to be hitting these tier 5s up here, especially the... Uh, where is this? Uh, charge Recoil, where when you hit monsters with rune arms, you can strip them of electric immunity. There are a lot of electric immune monsters once you start getting to around level 12, 13, 14, and they never slow down. So you want to make sure you actually do farm out a rune arm, and you want to make sure that rune arm allows you to hit multiple monsters. One of the best rune arms you can get is Stranati's Hand Cannon. It's extremely easy to farm, and it comes out of the Three Barrel Cove Adventure area. It's right in the middle. There's uh, tons of ways to get, like, it's really easy to get. It's super fast to get to especially if you have like a horse you can just reset it and go check it out multiple times very very easy to do so make sure you have something that is at least an area of effect so you can strip lightning immunity off of large groups of monsters um, and then the renegade master maker this is all tankiness you're picking up extra healing amplification uh toughness even just putting one point in here is 10 hit points at the start which will help you out in the early game and then you can move up to the embed component now, one thing I want to make sure is extremely clear is you get the Static Shock and you get the Lightning Sphere spell-like abilities. These things are great. However, before you get to level 6, uh, your spell damage is not going to be that great. It's okay. Lightning Sphere is not that bad of a spell, but Static Shock's like very mediocre uh, and Lightning Sphere barely gets the job done. So probably levels 1, 2, and 3, you're going to be using mostly the repeating crossbow. Don't worry about not doing a lot of damage. Just shoot the thing. It'll get most of the work done. And then once you and supplement with some magic, but once you get to about 4-ish, that's when you're kind of going full into magic. And then finally, once you have this Blast Rod spell-like ability and the actual Blast Rod spell, you're done with actually um, attacking monsters, and you're going to be casting your way through every single quest. Now moving on to specifics about what some of the spells are, this character uses... Um, not too many of the actual damage spells. Again, Static Shock is an okay amount of damage, but it's not really necessary to use most of the time. The spell-like ability is better than the spell, honestly. However, Lightning Sphere does do a good amount of damage, and you will want to use this along with the spell-like ability. Similarly with Blast Rod and Lightning Bolt, for some of that added uh, single target or area of effect damage you can get out of that. 
Lightning Motes is something that makes monsters take more damage um, from electricity, and so you want to use this on bosses. Open with Lightning Motes, and then hit them with all the other stuff that comes after that. And then finally, the tier, the level 6 spells is your bread and butter. I don't have to explain this, even though there's like, um, oops, um, really strong damage spell, really strong damage spell, and really strong damage spell. If you're finding you're learning low on damage and you don't have enough, I would say probably grab Arcane Tempest as a really great option right away. However, if you are killing stuff still and you're feeling good, once you get to level 15, take Reconstruct first. This is one button pressed, you're back to full health, and you can do this tons of times, so make sure you do that. Now, as far as the Epic Destiny goes, this character feeds right into Draconic Incarnation, and with a little bit of Fate Singer on the back half. Draconic Incarnation gives you the spell cost reduction, gives you the Lightning Breath, which is really nice, it gives you the Mantle, which adds a bunch of extra damage on all your spell attacks, it gives you the Extended Wellspring of Power, which means when you press Wellspring of Power, your big cooldown, it lasts for one minute out of every three, which is insane, This um, that ability is ridiculous, and it gives you a bunch of temporary hit points based, or not hit points, spell points based on your character level, which means you pretty much can't run out of spell points. Very versatile, strong, and I love this effect. And then just going up here, Dragon Form is this amazing Amazing. You press a button, it's very hard for your character to die, your spells cost basically nothing, and you can blast out magic like crazy. Now the reason why Fate Singer is because sometimes it's difficult to actually get all the skills you need, so this is plus three to all skills, so your character will be able to deal with all the traps and other things. Similarly, you get a little bit of spell power and some spell points and magic resistance rating. However, it's mostly Masquerade getting 10% spell cost reduction. With this 10%, this 10%, the 10% you get from epics and an item, that's 40% spell cost reduction. And you'll notice that while you have some cool spell-like abilities of the actual spells, amazingly powerful spell, amazingly powerful spell, amazingly powerful spell, and none of these have spell-like abilities. So you will be casting your spells very heavily, which means reducing the spell point cost as much as possible is essential for this character. Now, if you are sick of consistent and powerful characters, let's go with something wacky here. I was challenged to make sure I would include a Chains character, that is a character playing as a Shader Kai using the Chain ability, and I wanted to do that. It took a lot of time to actually come up with the right incarnation, but I think this one works pretty good. It's 10 Rogue, 7 Favorite Soul, and 3 Monk. The 10 Rogue is just useful. You get Rogue, gives you the ability to deal with traps, and you can be kind of tanky with having a good amount of dodge. However, you also got 7 Favorite Soul. The 7 Favorite Soul gives you a lot of extra hit points during the leveling and epic leveling process. And then 3 Monk allows you to get access to some very cool stuff in Grandmaster Flowers later on, and during the heroic leveling process, access to the Ocean Stance, which is insanely defensive. So keep that in mind. This character has a high dexterity, a little bit of constitution, some intelligence for traps, and some wisdom as well, putting all the points into dexterity. And it's important to note that this is actually a single weapon fighting character, which is very odd for a rogue. Usually they're two weapon fighters, but it works well here. Now the um, actual level split of the skills here is kind of confusing, but basically you max out your search um, and disable device, and then everything else falls by the wayside. This character does not really have a lot of space to fit spot into the build, because uh, the feats are really hard to actually fit in. So, or not the feats, but the points for the skills is hard to fit in. So what I would say is that uh, if you're somebody who doesn't know where all the traps are in the game, you may want to play something else before you play this, or at least brush up on your traps before you start doing a quest. Your character will have an extremely high amount of reflex saves and evasion, so you don't die to traps, but you might walk through a trap and you don't know it's there, and then your party member follows you and then cuss blat, and they're gone. So keep that in mind. Moving on to the actual feats, this character has a very odd feat following, but single weapon fighting, improved feint. Uh, talked about this earlier, improved feint just lets you sneak attack whatever you want, which is really strong. Additionally, you also grab uh, from the favorite soul. You start with three levels of rogue and then move into three favorite soul. The first three levels of rogue, just grab some potions or a hyaline to keep you alive, but then the next three levels of favorite soul is because you want to get access to some of the better healing abilities as well as close wounds. Close wounds is great. It's basically press a button and you heal yourself for almost like half of your hit points by the time you get it, and then later on it becomes even stronger and it becomes even stronger into epic. So very, very, very good. Additionally, You've also got the monk levels you take after that, because the monk levels give you access to the um, Path of the Harmonious Balance, which is very strong. It's basically a button you press that gives you uh, a healing ability, and you can use this healing ability all the time. And on top of that, it also allows you to start taking the forms feats to start getting the actual monk stances to be upgraded. So that's very good. 
Now, the reason why you want seven favorite souls, seven favorite soul gives you access to Stout of Heart, which gives you a ton of additional hit points. You take that next, and then you finish off Rogue. Rogue literally only gives you a lot of extra damage, and you might be worried about where you're spending points in your enhancement tree in the in interim, but this character is actually going to be a Vestani Knife Fighter, so you don't have to worry too much about actually having enough Rogue levels to spend points in the Rogue Trees. So going along, continuing, single weapon fighting, get the forms feats, get the extra damage, the double strike, the damage reduction, and then grabbing Sino the Astral Plane, something that most people usually don't take, but you take it because you're centered and it gives you a huge amount of additional stats, which is nice. Enhancement tree, kind of screwy, as I mentioned before. Vistani Night Fighter is the main thing, and Shader Kai. Shader Kai gives you the big chain effect, as well as displacement, which is insanely defensive. Vistani Night Fighter gives you the... Uh, whole bunch of damage with daggers and this is absolutely a dagger using character you go single weapon fighting for the single dagger for the 20 melee power and 20 melee power right here so it's 40 out of your heroic leveling you make sure to grab a beacon of hope because you want to grab closed wounds you want to maximize this which is why you take maximize spell at level six and as long as you maximize your closed wounds and maybe have like one healing effect item you should be very 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 strong and then finally assassin just to get that assassin's trick so you can sneak attack you know hard bosses that sort of thing uh, and just throw this out there, as well as Shiv, which gives you another opportunity to sneak attack monsters that would otherwise uh, stop that. Now, you have seven levels of Favorite Soul, so let's take a quick gander at the spells. Again, you're taking the stuff that's more defensive. You don't take any heals out of here. It sounds counterintuitive, but you really don't need any Favorite Soul heals. What you need is the uh, Close Wounds effect at a Favorite Soul. So instead, just take the defensive stuff. Bless, uh, Night Shield to prevent death from magic missiles. Um, spawn Screen to prevent death from shadow damage, because when shadows attack you, they drain your strength, and if you run out of strength, you die. So Spawn Screen prevents that. You also want Prayer, because Prayer is really nice. It keeps you protected and gives you a bunch of extra skill checks when you're trying to find traps on this character. And of course, Magic Circle Against Evil makes you immune to mind-affecting abilities from evil creatures, such as the spell Command, which is really, really nice. And then going into the Epic Destinies, this is where I've said it kind of gets weird sometimes, Grandmaster of Flowers. Because you have the monk points, uh, you can actually specialize really heavily into the stunning DCs in Epics, and you can play as a character that whips a chain around, single weapon fights with a dagger ability, and then has this drifting lotus effect, so you have this boom, big critical hit, because it gives you a huge amount of critical threat range and multiplier on it, so you're just slamming monsters down, but even better, it's an area of effect stun that super slams people down, and on top of that, you've got everything is nothing for an AoE instant kill all around you once you get to level 30, and split the soul, which gives you 50% concealment, incorporeality, and dodge. Now this character, with no items equipped, already has 26% dodge at the level cap, so 76% dodge for 30 seconds is extremely powerful and something that's very cool for this type of character. Then you put some points into Shadow Dancer to get some more sneak attack, as well as Darkest Luck, which makes it so that your character doesn't take improved evasion, but you actually get improved evasion, which is very convenient for the leveling process. Although I do make sure you take no fail reflex save C just so you don't die. And then, as I said, the extra tactics out of legendary dreadnought here. Very, very cool character. Uh, something I have not, I haven't tested this character at all. So this is kind of the most sketchy character on this list. But if this sounds interesting to you to have a chain whipping around, um, make sure you try this out. Uh, this character only works with Shader Kai and Favorite Soul and Monk and Vistani Night Fighter. Uh, you can try a different variation, but if you don't have all those things, this character won't work, and you'll need to try something else. Now, let's talk about my character. What am I playing? People ask me all the time. And well, I'm gonna be playing Favorite Soul as my first character. When the guild opens up, I wanna make sure I have all of the gold I can possibly get, and so I wanna buy all the amenities to make sure that people that join in can get the ship buffs as soon as possible. But that involves getting high level to get a lot of gold, so I'm gonna be pushing to level 20 on the first day and 30 on the second day. And I'm gonna be doing that with a Favorite Soul. Favorite Soul Spellcaster is extremely strong, extremely offensive, and extremely defensive because you get a bunch of hit points for free from being a favorite soul you get a bunch of ab spell absorption and you get insane healing You're gonna be a very strong character i'm going with dragonborn here and i'm using charisma as my base stat just because i get more charisma leveling up my charisma and then putting my constitution in here important note this is going to be a 32 point build um for me if you don't have 32 point build just take two points out of constitution and maybe put some more strength or something doesn't really matter but 18 20 is where i am personally going now for the leveling process, um, I don't have enough intelligence, but I don't care. So I'm just putting points in Spellcraft because it gives me a little bit more damage. The skills don't matter. And it actually makes it level up faster because you have to click less things when you go into the skill menu, which is very convenient. 
As far as the feats go, this character gets a fair amount of spell-like abilities, specifically the healing spell-like ability right away, which is the um, closed wounds. So we want maximize and quicken spell. And then after that, we want to grab the evocation effects, which is really nice. Force of personality to allow my charisma to apply to my uh, will saves. If you went wisdom instead, you don't have to do this, but I'm going charisma. If you wanted to play as a wisdom character, say as like a uh, Asimar, you can do that. But I went for more damage, and I'll talk about that in a little bit later. And then empower spell for my spell-like abilities, and just picking up some toughness. I don't want to die, so just grab some more health. Additionally, I went follow the Sovereign Host for Unyielding Sovereignty. Uh, I did this strictly because I think that Unyielding Sovereignty is really nice. Um, it just protects people in your party, and I am not worried about needing it for myself. I'm mostly worried about using it on other people, although you may be interested on in using something like this on yourself to remove all of the conditions listed below. And then moving on to epics, very standard, well spring of power because it's high damage, um, epic spell power of light and fire because you cast light and fire spells, intensifies for some even more damage, burst of glacial wrath because it's a defensive, you know, it's your only crowd control you're really going to have on an evocation focused character, so it's really, really strong. Uh, and then I'm taking Fount of Life because I am using the um, Exalted Angel Epic Destiny, and that actually gives you a Fount of Life here, or it has a bonus based on Fount of Life. I also grabbed Epic Spell Focus Evocation. I was thinking about taking Emboldened Spell, but I only cast Evocation Spells, and this doesn't cost me anymore, and so it's going to depend heavily on like whether I actually need the extra spell points, so we'll see. Emboldened may be better here, but I am undecided. And then Sign of Celestia for the hit points and the extra DCs on this character. Now moving on to the Enhancement Tree, this character uses Angel of Vengeance, Beacon of Hope, and Dragon Born. Now, I have access to all the Enhancement Trees. If I wanted more hit points, I could go Falconry. If I wanted more defense, I could go Fade Arc Illusionist. This character is offense, I need to level fast, and I need to kill things quick. So we are not too worried about that. Dragonborn, Angel of Vengeance, Beacon of Hope. Uh, Angel of Vengeance is fairly straightforward. At level 1... You're going to be taking this Nimbus of Light spell-like ability because it's really powerful. So always grab this right away. You want to be using the Nimbus of Light spell-like ability super duper duper early. So keep that in mind. Additionally, at the level one process, or not level one, but uh, you get the option to take an Ember weapon. Take the Ember Longsword. It's not good at level one, but once you're at level two, you can now automatically charisma hit and damage with this and just at least swing the weapon around a little bit during the leveling process when you're getting there. But you want to get... Uh, this close wounds effect as soon as possible so try to put nimbus of light for your level one maybe level two but then once you have eight points max out close wounds you can't die and just deal with the fact that it's a little bit slower to swing that long sword it doesn't matter how long it takes to kill the monsters as long as you have this maxed out at level two you literally can't die and no one else in your party can die either so just get this as soon as possible and then once you have the eight points spent in here for the closed wounds that is where you're going to spend the rest of your points in Angel of Vengeance. Just boom, fill up this tree, get that Sunbolt, go up here to grab the Smiting, grab the Just Reward if you want, grab the Cheaper Maximize, the Cheap Quick, and the Charisma, all that other stuff, and move your way up the tree. I personally do not take the Comet Fall spell-like ability. I understand why people take it, because it can be useful to have the extra Comet Fall, but personally, I'm just going to kill everything. I don't care too much. And even though this does a lot of damage, maybe it's something I'll change my mind on, but uh, I, I'm not uh, too, too interested in this spell for the most part. I can actually just cast it if I want to cast it. The Dragonborn is what comes absolutely last. This is extra charisma, and it, while you do get the Dragon Breath spell-like ability, which could maybe be useful, uh, it doesn't scale off your level for the DC, so it's got a much lower DC than a lot of other weapon effects, and it has a lower spell power scaling, so it's just really not that nice. But what matters more is DC of Breath Attacks, which will come in later, the Draconic Knowledge here, which gives me the cast level and max cast level of the spells I cast, and the uh, Conjuration Evocation DCs. Plus three Evocation DCs is amazing, and it's the best thing you can get from a racial tree, and I'm an Evocation caster, so very happy. And this Draconic Knowledge applies to all my fire spells, and I have lots of good fire spells. Firestorm, Celestial Bombardment, and your epic fire abilities, which is very cool. Additionally, this character here, each core gives you extra spell caster levels, so again, you're going to be getting a lot of extra damage uh, out of your character, so just keep that in mind. This character is all about damage, all about killing people, and uh, a little bit of healing on the back end. The reason for Favorite Soul for me is just, it allows me to deal a lot of damage, go fast, and also protect my allies, so it's very nice. Uh, spells, as I talked about with Cleric, you want to take the offensive spells when you have the opportunity, and then take the defensive spells secondary. Uh, Death Ward, insanely important. Make sure you, if you ha can cast the spell, you should have the spell on. Cast it on your friends if they need it. Uh, my god, this is just such a good spell. 
Flame Strike, very nice. Word of Recall is in case of emergency. Take Holy Aura. Um, a lot of people don't take Holy Aura and don't cast this spell, but Holy Aura gives you a plus four bonuses to saves, armor class, as well as immunity to charms and mental compulsions. Uh, plus four saving throws is really good. With this character, because I get plus four saving throws from Holy Aura, and I get plus six to saving throws from Prayer, I can up everyone's saving throws by 10 by just being in the party, and that's kind of cool. Uh, so keep that in mind. This is extremely useful. Make sure you're taking both of these abilities. And then, of course, your epic spells. Uh, a lot of people will try to take other stuff like heal or energy drain and things. Don't take that. Level 9, Celestial Bombardment is killing everybody in one hit. Implosion, killing people in one hit. And it's an evocation spell, so it's just even better. And, of course, Divine Wrath. All very good stuff. And then moving into the epics with this character, Exalted Angel, this is your bread and butter. Uh, remember when I said you get bonus cast levels with fire spells? Hey, you know what's a fire spell? Holy Fireball. But this is a fire and a light spell. I haven't tested it, but I have a feeling that this gets bonus cash levels from both fire and light spells, which means your Holy Fireball might even be able to do upwards with on a character like this, somewhere around 40,000 damage when you press it. I'm going to test it out, but I think I might be able to do that, so that could be pretty fun. But Exalted Angel, grabbing the Angelic Form, grabbing the Holy Presence, so you have the automatic healing. You grab the Sun Pillar. Sun Pillar is just strictly better than Fire Pillar because... Um, the sun, even though I get a little bit extra damage from the fire pillar, not, the fire pillar is not always going to work on stuff, but sun pillar will work on every single monster, so always take sun pillar instead of fire pillar on this character. Cheaper metamagics is essential, and the uh, removed cost of intensify, again, essential. And then Dragonic Incarnation for the 10% spell cost reduction, and then getting the Coal Essence and the Arcane Studies. This character has a lot of uh, spell power kind of charged into it, so I've got, you know, a good amount of hit points on here. Not too much physical magical resistance rating, I'm very heavily reliant on items for that, but, you know, having 340 light spell power with not even a single item equipped yet feels pretty good for this type of character. So now it's time to break down the second character I'm going to be playing, which is for the 5,000 Favor. The character that I'm going to be using for 5,000 Favor. So if you'd like to play along or try to copy what I'm going to be doing for that goal, if you want to reach that yourself, feel free to check this out. This is a Gnome Alchemist Rogue. The benefit of the uh, Alchemist is that it's explody and it blows up everything really easily. And the Rogue allows you to do traps. Usually I would play a pure Alchemist, but I think that... For going for the 5k, being able to deal with traps the entire way is very convenient. This character, you max out your intelligence being an intelligence-based spellcaster, which means that you're always going to be able to have enough skill points to be able to take all the good rogue stuff, and then the rest of the things, constitution and strength. Now, again, I mentioned strength a lot. It's important to note that usually you don't have to worry about strength too much because on your main characters, maybe you've got tomes. Maybe you have ship buffs. But when Hardcore League starts, you don't have either of those things, and becoming over-encumbered is a death trap. So just keep that in mind. You don't want to become over-encumbered. So, we take four skills. Fairly straightforward. The first level is Rogue, so you max out basically whatever you can, which is almost every skill in the game. But then through the Alchemist levels, Search, Spot, um, Disable the Vice. Fortunately for an Alchemist, Search and Spot are actually class skills for some reason, and I have no idea why. But then you also want to max out Spellcraft, because it gives you extra damage. Heal, because it gives you extra healing. And then all the other good stuff. Haggle, Balance, Bluff, Use Magic Device, very powerful abilities. You are not putting any points into Open Lock. Your character cannot open locks uh, with a pick. Uh, just, I don't think it's going to be that valuable. You're not going to have that many stats anyway. And your intelligence is going to be higher. Just cast the spell Melt Lock from Alchemist. You do not need to take Open Lock here. Um, Melt Lock will not hit every lock in the game. The only lock I can think of that would actually maybe matter and be relevant is if you're looking at picking open the lock inside of the quest, um, the House of Death Undone, which requires like, I think a plus 80 or so to actually make it, and you cannot get there ever with Melt Lock. However, you to get to that point that's an epics, just buy a bell and get through the door or have a friend or do the quest the actual way and get the key from some dude somewhere else in the quest. Anyway, moving along. Class and levels, what do you take? Well, at Rogue level 1, you can't take any of the other feats that you actually want to take, which means you just take toughness. Now, the hardest part about this character is your first few levels, which is why I recommend grouping. Group with people, play Rogue, disable traps for people. Once you take level 1 of Alchemist, you know, you can go learn all the spells if you want, which is important, but take some of the healing spells right away and just heal people. 
at the beginning. Heal people, disable traps. Heal people, disable traps. Everyone's going to love you. You're going to be easily able to level up in a group. Just join whatever group you can, get a couple levels. Once you have a few levels, you actually can cast spells. Scourge is going to be a lot powerful, or a lot more powerful. But until then, you have, like, no strengths. You can't actually do any damage to monsters. You have no uh, dexterity, and, and, like, you're just all intelligence. So, like I said, disable traps for people, heal them. And then once you get to around, like, level four, five, six, that's when you start doing the big damage. Um, for this one, you want to grab the meta magic feats, uh, maximize spell, quicken spell, and later on empower. And then from the alchemist bonus feats, you're grabbing the pyrite studies for the damage. Insightful Courage, so you get Intelligence to Will Saves. Uh, Liquid Luck for uh, Evasion. Now, you could take two levels of Rogue here instead of taking Liquid Luck, but every Alchemist level actually matters because it actually increases your cash level and the rate at which you acquire spells. You really want to get your spells early, and I'd rather take Liquid Luck than a second level of Rogue, so you have a little bit more spell damage, especially when you move into Epics. And then the Epic Alchemist, or the Advanced Alchemist studies here for some extra damage with your Crimsonite and Guild Leaf spells. Now, moving on into the epics, this character, um, you're going to want to be taking the Wellspring of Power Feet, as well as Epic Spell Power Acid, Master of Spell Vials to increase your damage moving into epics, Toughness, Epic Damage Reduction, Deific Warding, Fortitude, and Sign of the Plane of Earth, which got changed to max out Conjuration DCs, which is the DCs you need for your spells. Important note about this is that the actual... Uh, Master of Spell Files feat is really nice at bumping up your damage, but since you don't have the capstone of Alchemist, you're missing out on uh, plus four to your DCs, which is a huge amount for epics, and you're also missing out on the other multi-vile spell-like ability, so this isn't the best character to go to 30 with, but it gets the job done. If you do want to play an Alchemist all the way to 30, it's probably better to go pure, and then the changes to this character are very, very minor, so just keep that in mind. As far as the actual enhancement tree goes, you're spending most of your points in the Bombardier tree, a little bit in Apothecary, a little bit in Gnome, a little bit in Falconry. The Bombardier tree is giving you your damage. You get a whole bunch of damage all over the place. So picking up extra Conjuration DCs, um, you know, extra, extra spell powers and criticals and all that other good stuff. So you're picking up a lot of good things, as well as the Jeeper Maximize and Quicken. Because while you do have a lot of spell-like abilities, uh, you know, you've got the uh, Vial of Acid here, you've got the... Uh, caustic obliteration well that's all good but you actually have mostly regular spells you don't get the best spell like ability the multi vial right here unfortunately which means you're casting all your spells pretty hard just hard casting them to so maximize is where you want to go out of the apothecary tree you're able to pick up the alchemical shield here which gives you the bonus to your armor class and immunity to magic missiles as well as some spell power which is kind of nice but most importantly you get this cure serious add mixture cure serious wounds um like ability and you can apply all your meta magic feats to this and basically use this to keep yourself alive the entire way through epic leveling falconry is just nice because it gives you sprint boost which makes you move fast as well as conditioning which gives you five percent quality bonus hit points now it's important to note that you can actually get sprint boost as an alchemist but sprint boost as an alchemist comes at fifth level alchemist spells which is level 13 on this character and you can get this before level 13 if you want to move fast and then Gnome is just for some extra intelligence. And then Blur, because in case you're not blurry, uh, you might not always have dis Displacement Draught active um, or Displacement Draft. So that's one of the reasons why we take Blur here. If you're somebody who's very good at casting Displacement Draft, don't take Blur, and you can spend that point wherever you want instead. As far as the actual Alchemist spells, I've said this about the other characters, but take the damage spells when you can, and then swap them out later for the non-damage spells. So for example, I have them all here. Uh, Vile Smash Acid, Corrode Weapons, Caustic Solvent, um, where's the other one? Uh, Caustic Overload, the Multi Vial of Acid. Once you're at here, you're casting Multi Vial, you're casting Caustic Overload, you're casting Caustic Solvent, you're probably not using Vile Smash level one spell, so you don't even have to worry about this later on. But at the beginning, you want as many spells as you can get, and then you swap out the damage spells as you go along. All these buffs here are really, really strong, whether it's the stiffened skin or the elemental skin to giving you defenses, getting greater liquid or greater liquid courage is extremely good, as well as the quicksilver potion and displacement draft. And then, like I said, being able to use bottle brew sprint to move really quickly, gold or not flat gold skin, greater evolution for plus four intelligence, or the gold skin potion, a lot of really good defensive abilities here, and a lot of damage as well. 
and then moving on finally to the epic destinies here this is going to take a bit of a turn but i actually want to go with primal avatar and there's a couple reasons number one i think that poison fits okay into the draconic incarnation it actually has some other good abilities here mostly the hellstorm if you're trying to get extra stacks of venom concentration the problem is venom concentration is a good raid spell it's not a good quest spell monsters are usually going to die um before you actually get any high amount of stacks and trying to get seven stacks of that is going to be nonsense However, Primal Avatar has a lot of really cool, powerful abilities. Carrion Swarm is an insane clearing ability, and since you are an Acid Alchemist on this character, and I have it set up all for Acid, uh, your character doesn't have to worry about like getting damage on this. You're going to have a lot. Additionally, Shard Storm, same thing, does a whole bunch of damage, and it gives you a temporary shield, and so every time you press Shard Storm, which should be all the time, uh, you're always getting a shield on yourself to keep yourself protected. Additionally, Primal Avatar gives you a lot of good defensive stuff, like um, getting, well... Did I say defensive? I meant offensive. More intelligence, more mana, so you can cast more spells. You get a hit point bonus whenever you rest, and so resting becomes really nice. And for some reason, you can take plus uh, 18 off of your maximize, meaning you can reduce the cost of maximize to zero. As well, you can make intensify cost six points less. So in you can maximize and intensify any spell you want for a total cost of four, which is pretty cool. And outside of that... The Thorn Cloud is just this insane cooldown you can press. Mass Frog is not always going to work, but it's really strong on Constructs who have no will save, which makes it very, very good. Ancient Wisdom for the spell DCs is nice. And then the Briar Patch. I don't know how useful this uh, summon actually is. However, it's very, very good when you have quests where you want to stay away from actual monsters or bosses. An easy example would be inside of the last quest, the Age of Rage. Uh, this quest features a very, very scary and devastating beholder, and it summons a bunch of adds and all sorts of monsters. If you're playing this on epics, and maybe you're going for some of that reprex XP, dropping the Briar Patch down so it's actually going to be attacking monsters means it's also absorbing damage from hits that are incoming, which makes it very good. The weird thing is the mantle. You're actually using the Shrani mantle on this character. And the reason I say that, there's two reasons. Number one, you get access to the good luck ability, which gives you a bonus to your saving throws and skill checks, which is nice. But most importantly, because Prism is really strong where with abilities where you can attack quickly. You want to hit fast, 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 fast. And Alchemists just kind of whip out spells. You're constantly throwing spells, spell vial, 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 vial. And since you cast a lot, you don't have to worry about the 30% um, chance here. It's going to be going off pretty much constantly. Versus the mantle, you could take the Primal Avatar mantle, which is actually kind of interesting. The problem is that it has a cooldown of five seconds. Your character is going to be casting like two spells a second, which means that you're going to get these procs off, you get the acid, the force, the poison, and now you have to wait like three seconds to actually get any more abilities versus Shroudy Champion, where you're just going to be going boom, 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 and blowing everything up. So bear in mind, very, very cool, very, very strong effects. And uh, I think it's better for Alchemist to spend your points sort of like this. Don't worry about not having self-healing in Epics. You're an Alchemist. You have all the amazing heal spells. So you'll be able to use uh, them and, and kind of clear your way through no problem. And last but not least, an extra include, I think it's just a very powerful character in general and something that will be very good, is Single Weapon Fighter Paladin. This character is going to be something, if you like playing melee, and you like having area of effect, and you like having good single target, and just having a good time, as well as being supportive, because you can grab wands and other things to heal up your party members, but then also just do a ton of damage, single weapon fighter paladin is for you. This character is maxing out on charisma, and is going to be a charisma using character. You can technically play this as strength based if you want, by just dumping your charisma down by a whole lot, and maxing out strength instead, and putting your points into strength, but this build is for charisma. So we're going Dragonborn for the Strength and Charisma, and you don't really need the extra feats, so that's why we do that. As far as the skill points go, uh, I have a 10 Intelligence on this one. Uh, you don't care too much about your skill points, but it is nice to have Intimidate, and it is nice to have some healing. However, most importantly, you need to have Balance. You need 7 ranks and Balance total, which is why you max out your Balance, and then once your Balance is at 7, you then put the rest of the points in Heal to have a little bit of extra healing. As far as the feats go, single weapon fighting is the name of the game. You grab magical training at level 3 because for the first couple of levels you're fighting monsters that basically have no defenses, so you don't really need to care too much about the amount of damage that you deal, but once you start moving higher you actually do want to get the charisma to hit and damage effect, so you go single weapon fighting at 1 and then grab magical training a little bit later. You also grab Follower of Onatar because this is a Warhammer build, and Warhammers are very cool and received a big, big buff in the last patch. So I want to include Warhammers in here because Warhammers are extremely useful on Hardcore League specifically because this is Hardcore 1, which means we're fighting the original set of champions in basic DDO. 
So, if you're a melee character, the only champion that really screws you up is the Stone Guard, where you can't do a lot of damage to them if you're using a slashing weapon. But if you're using a bludgeoning weapon, well, now they don't even matter. You just kind of smash through them. So you grab the single weapon fighting feet line, bludgeoning weapon, uh, critical effect here, greater single weapon fighting. Now you might ask, okay, how did they improve it? Well, what they did is they changed the feat called Knight's Training to now apply a plus two morale bonus to the critical threat range of Warhammers as opposed to one, which is an extra 5% crit chance boost, which is exactly what you need to make this on par with any type of longsword or kopesh or that sort of thing. So it's very, very cool. Overrunning critical, perfect single weapon fighting, uh, grabbing some extra damage here. A lot of very standard stuff, stuff you've seen in some of the other build guides here. Um, just either, everything here is taken either for direct damage or direct defense. Very straightforward, very strong for what they want to do. Except the only difference that this character takes is I like to go with crush weakness. And the reason is this character help, makes things helpless all the time. And you'll see why in a little bit. As far as the enhancement tree actually goes. Uh, this character is spending most of its points in Knight of the Chalice because it's really, really strong uh, offensively with some defensive leadings. However, this also wants to use Sacred Defender, Fade Dark Lucius, and Vistani Night Fighter. I highly recommend you have all of these things. If you don't have Fade Dark, you can skip all the stuff in here and play Strength instead. Like I said, just skip the, put the uh, Charisma into Strength here. Just swap them. So you have four, 20 and 14 down here. Take your points out of Feydark, and you can spend them more in Sacred Defender if you want to grab some more Constitution from your stance, or spend them in uh, Dragonborn to get some more Strength, whatever you think is appropriate. But Pistani is extremely good. So out of Knight of the Chalice, you're picking up the extra Smites, the Divine Might, which is why the Charisma Scaling is so good, on top of the fact that it gives you bonuses to your saves based on your Charisma. The, all the Cleaves, so the fact that you're using a single weapon fighting doesn't matter that you don't have area of effect like Strike Through, you can just keep cleaving through monsters really easily, and picking up a bunch of damage. Now, I don't actually take nice training in the build, and the reason is because you get it for free here. You don't actually need to take the feat, you just take nice training and it automatically gives it to you, which is really, really nice. Um, as well as some of the instant kills up here, and you grab some of the Sunder just a little bit just to help out with that Sunder DC. Fade Dark Lucius gives you Chrisman damage, and I kind of recommend you rush this as soon as you can have access to it. Uh, getting Illusory Weaponry just means you can always hit monsters, never worry about actually breaking your weapons when you attack any type of thing, which is very convenient, plus an extra plus one to hit and damage. Blurry is great because you can't blur yourself as a paladin, and then immunity to magic missiles. We've talked about this before, but it's very good. Now, why Vistani Knife Fighter? Well, there's two reasons. Reason number one, haste boost is the best action boost in the entire game. It gives you the most amount of damage, and it feels really, really good to actually use. And second, 11 points gives you some even more double strike and quick draw, allowing you to quickly change weapons fast, whether it's swapping to a wand to heal yourself or allies, or uh, just going in between an action boost and a physical attack. So that's kind of the breakdown here. Generally, the Vistani stuff is literally the least important thing. It's all just extra damage, so I would leave this for dead, dead last. And then as soon as you can, grab the Fade Arc Illusionist stuff to pick up the Illusory Weapon, Charisma, and Damage. And then on top of that, you also... So you should have this Fade Arc Illusionist tree pretty much filled out by level... Not filled out, but 7 points for the Familiars for Flourish 2, plus this and this by level 7-ish. Not level 7, sorry, level 4-ish. And then you want to grab the Sacred Defender for the extra Sacred Defense Stance, as well as the Durable Defense, just to keep yourself a little bit more protected. Knight of the Chalice, important, and spend your points here at pretty much after that. So you go like 7 here, maybe like, what's this, 6 here to grab Sacred Defense, and then Knight of the Chalice, all the rest of the points, then come over here and fill out um, Fader Occlusionist, then fill out Vistani, again, that sort of thing. As far as the Paladin spells go, you don't actually need any of the raise spells because, well, you can't raise people because there's no raising on Hardcore League. So instead, go with the defensive ones. Bless for all the hit chance, Angel Skin for the free physical magical resistance rating, Righteous Command for the extra melee range power. Important note that these spells are affected, they have a maximum cash level, but the maximum cash level has gone up with epics, so they actually give you more melee range power and more physical magical resistance rating, which is pretty cool. Magic Circle against Evil protects you from all those mental compulsions we talked about. Prayer is plus 5 to hit damage, like, well, I don't need to say anymore, that's good enough. And then Holy Sword, bread and butter for damage. Zeal, bread and butter for damage. Death Ward is Death Ward, we've talked about Death Ward already here. Uh, put this on so you don't get instantly killed by stuff that you can't predict. And then Sour Pact is just nice because if you fall below 50%, it gives you a uh, temporary hit point shield, which is very, very nice. So just keep that in mind. It's just a good protective effect. Moving on to the epics, 
This character uses Dreadnought, and again, that's why I said it's a good idea here to go with the extra helplessness damage, as your character is going to make monsters helpless. Stunning DCs, stunning DC, or tactics DCs here. Your character has a ton of stunning, especially with the uh, extra DCs you get from the uh, Divine Might ability directly out of Paladin. This character, Legendary Dreadnought, you're going to come in and you're going to Dire Charge people down. On top of not only Dire Charging people to knock them down and make them stun, you also get Displacement whenever you use an Action Boost, which is constantly, you're constantly pressing Action Boost because you have so many here from the extra Action Boost. You get plus six to your maximum dexterity bonus with armor at dusk, meaning that as a medium armor character, you can still have a high maximum dexterity bonus. You get this legendary rally, which is both a crowd control break, which is amazing to be able to break crowd control and protect yourself when you're about to die, but also it's a huge damage hit. And then of course, action hero, where you press this button and you become a god for 30 seconds. Now this character also uses the Grandmaster of Flowers mantle instead of the Dreadnought mantle, and the main reason is this gives you more movement speed, and it also gives you just uh, a lot of better points for, or a lot of good things for fewer points, and allows you to get Adamantine and Evil damage here. You take uh, Adamantine, because Adamantine bypass in every weapon is convenient, you take Evil bypass because you already have good and lawful, it adds your alignment to your weapons uh, from being a paladin, so you don't have to worry about that, so you grab the Evil damage here, so you don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, and then finally, on Yielding Sentinel, you grab the six points for Renewal. Uh, this six points is what you start with. You take this at 20. You don't wait. You don't say, oh, I'll take the Renewal Yielding Sentinel later. No, if you have Renewal, it's very difficult to die. Because when you start taking damage, you just press Renewal, and then you keep fighting monsters. So take Renewal first. Then you want to go into Dreadnought and get up to here with Momentum Swing. And then start putting points in other places. Or if you want, you can even put three points into Serenity right away. Just get some more movement speed. But then you want Momentum Swing and kind of go from there. Anyways, this has been the Hardcore Season 5 build guides. Now, if none of these things really tickled your fancy, you're like, oh man, I some of these are so cool, but they just don't really do what I want. Don't worry. In the link below, you can find all of these things. Easy access to... Uh, all the, the data here, so you don't try to copy it from the video. You've got access to the files and stuff. That's all going to be on below. So if you want to download any of these things, or like I said, if you want to do a written version, or if you need more builds, there'll be more links below. That'll take you directly to it. There's a big going to be a big repository post, so please check that one out for every single thing that you need. Anyways, good luck on Hardcore, everybody. Get all of those rewards. Hopefully you'll be winning and rolling around with these bloody footprints just like everybody else. And I can't wait to see you all in Hardcore League. Goodbye.